At the age of 15, my parents did me the biggest favor they never knew they did for me. They moved me from Miami, Florida to Brownwood, Texas. My dad said, you're going to play football for the same guy that I played for when I was in high school. And by the age of 15, I'd learned the art of sarcasm, just like your kids. And I looked at my dad and I said, well, is that guy still alive? <laughs> and when I got up, he said yes. <laughs> but there are a few things he forgot to tell me about high school football in the state of Texas. He did not tell me that football in the state of Texas runs from August 1st through July 30th. He also did not tell me that my football coach hated baseball. Coach Wood's favorite saying is, I would rather watch grass grow than be forced to watch a baseball game. So we had no high school baseball team. I got to play 10 games a summer. I went from 60 games being a freshman on the varsity in Florida to 10 games during the summer. But the favor that my parents did for me so we moved back to Texas, they moved me into my grandparents' house. Ironically, my father's parents. My grandfather, Ernest Morris, had a menswear store in Brownwood, Texas for over 30 years. Everybody knew my grandfather. Fought in World War II, lost his brother there. He knew actors in Hollywood, politicians in D.C. He knew everybody in Texas. And they would all come to him for his opinion. One day I'm sitting in the store and I'm working for him in the summer and Gene Autry walks in. How many people are old enough to remember who that is? I was impressed. I'm like, you're from Hollywood. And he said, shut up. <laughs> You've talked to my grandfather, I see. But great guys, and he knew everybody, and they would come to him for his opinion because even if he told you what you did not want to hear, you, he had a way of saying it that when you walked out of his office, you had your head held higher. And every day I watched my grandfather work, six foot three, 250 pound man, amazing person. Five years ago in Houston, Texas, this 92 year old little man walks up to me after my speech. He opens the lapel of his jacket and it has Ernest Morris menswear. And then he started crying. Well, something about men, when we get in our 40s and 50s, I cried with him. <laughs> it's amazing when you look back to things that you've been through. They are what makes you who you are. My grandparents made me the person standing on this stage. I'm not saying I learned every lesson as they taught it to me, but eventually it did click in. During the summers, I worked for my grandfather, and he had lessons to teach me. And every day I listened to these lessons, and every day I learned something new. Jimmy, you're born with your name and you die with your name. What you do with it in between is a legacy you leave behind for everybody else. Son, who do you want to be? Jimmy, if you ever make a promise, you live up to that promise no matter what, because at the end of the day, when you pass away, you're going to be remembered for one thing. Did you keep your word? Jimmy, it takes a lifetime to build good character. It takes one mistake to destroy everything you've ever worked for. Who are you going to be, son? One day at 9.05 a.m. on a Monday morning, all the men were in the back having coffee. And when I say men, they were all about my grandfather's age, the early 60s. I'm up in the front, and this lady walks in. She's got on overalls and a cowboy hat, and she's got boots. And let's just say from the smell of the boots, she had a pig farm. <laughs> all of the men were drinking their coffee and talking. They looked up, and then they acted like they did not see this lady. My grandfather saw this from his office. He walked out. He stared out of the corner of his eye, which can melt metal. I never heard him raise his voice, but that glare would scare you to death. He walked up to this woman. He treated her like gold. Before she walked out of his, his menswear store, she had bought 15 suits for every male in her family and paid in cash. And when he walked back by me, he said, we are not the ones allowed to judge other people. It doesn't matter if you dig ditches or you're the president of the United States. We don't, touch, we don't judge them. We all bleed red. We're all God's children. It's our job to live along and get along. That was my grandfather. My grandmother was our church secretary for over 30 years. When my grandfather was 6'3", my grandmother was 5 feet tall. I never heard a crossword for the first 15 years of my life 
I heard my parents argue, curse, scream, hit, throw, punch, and do everything else. In the next three years, from 15 to 18, I heard two people get along. They never said anything they could not take back. Now, there were days of silence. <laughs> but they didn't say anything they couldn't take back. Mutual respect. My grandfather had me take my grandmother on lunch dates once a week the entire time I was in school so I would know how to treat women, how to walk closer to traffic, how to open car doors, restaurant doors, pull out chairs, fold out napkins. He wanted me to be prepared for life. And then he would grade me on how I did, which wasn't the bad part because my grandmother had already graded me. <laughs> fantastic people, fantastic role models. And since we're in Texas, I'm telling this story of my grandfather. He loved the Dallas Cowboys when Tom Landry was the head football coach. Yeah. <laughs> coach Landry would drive into Brownwood, Texas, and buy a hat from him, then wear it on the sidelines. My grandfather also sang in the church choir. Now, if the cowboys were kicking off at noon and the preacher was a little long-winded, my grandfather would say amen and church was over. <laughs> we got to help Coach Landry win that game. I loved him because he, he stood for what is right the most honest person I've ever known in my life. And every day for three years, he had the same saying that I heard every day for three years. Back in the 80s and late 70s, when men used to wear three-piece suits all the time, he would be buttoning his vest, he would look out of his bedroom door as I walked out the front door to go to school, and he would look at me and he'd go, Jimmy, remember who you are. Remember who you are and where you came from. Now, as a teenager, I thought that saying meant, remember that you're my grandson, and if you embarrass me in any way, I will kill you. <laughs> it took me until years later, until I was 35, actually, and I had kids of my own and was responsible for so many other kids to realize what my grandfather was talking about. It's not about me. Not only is it not about me, it's never been about me. It's about those people that I can help. That makes me a better me. If I'm a dream maker and I'm a mentor and I'm teaching people the right way to do things, that's what God wants out of me. And it's not lip service he wants because people, they can hear the words. They don't have to listen to the words. They watch the actions. They want to watch what you're going to do, not what, hear what you're going to say. Don't think that your kids are not picking up every single point of body language that you have because they are. My grandfather was an awesome man. During my senior year, after the counselor and the coach talked to me, I found out I had nowhere to go. My grades were horrible. I didn't study. I listened to my dad tell me how dumb I was. It was at this point in time that my grandfather was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. I did not understand this disease. The nurse quit firing. The muscles can't move. You watch the person you love wither away in front of you. There's nothing you or science can do about it. My grandfather went from a cane to a walker to a wheelchair in six months. In 18 months, he had lost 150 pounds, was curled up in a fetal position in a hospital bed, unable to speak or move. Before the disease took my grandfather's voice, he and I are sitting at the kitchen table by ourselves one night. He's in a wheelchair, he's hooked up to oxygen, he's stooped over, he's looking at me over the top of his glasses, and I tell people, Morris men, we're not condescending, we're just too lazy to push our glasses up. So my wife's always, push your glasses up, I can't see your eyes. Yes, ma'am. I looked at my grandfather, I was 18, I had my whole life in front of me, and I said, this is not fair, you've done nothing but great things for everybody you've ever encountered your whole life, this is not fair, why did God do this to you? I threw his faith back at him. I was 18, it's not much of an excuse, but that's the one I have. He looked at me, took in some oxygen, and he said, son, who do you think you are? I've worked my whole life to get to where I'm going. Where are you headed? That has stuck with me and will stick with me until the day I die. He had a plan. He worked that plan. He knew what to do and when to do it. He knew how to say things to make people feel better about themselves. 
But not only that, he knew when somebody needed a hug or a handshake or a pat on the back, and he was able to do that. As men, that is our job now. We have wives, we have girlfriends, we have moms, we have grandmothers, we have kids. And I'm going to tell you right now something about kids. You're going to blink and they're going to be gone because they grow up fast. That's what my grandfather taught me. To this day in Brownwood, there's never been a larger funeral take place than my grandfather's. People came from everywhere to pay the respects to a man they knew lived for other people. And I never quite understood at 18 how he carried this disease with the grace and dignity that he did and never complained and never whined. The last time he was alive and he went to church, his 18-year-old grandson carried him in. But he never complained. And then last year, after 10 years of chasing something I didn't know what it was, I found out that I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. It's not the same thing my grandfather had, but I immediately got why my grandfather held his head high and kept pushing forward. He was being a mentor and a role model for me and my brother and everybody else who was willing to watch. The first time I fell down in the living room and my wife and my three girls saw that, they started bawling. Their job is to go out and chase their dreams. It's not to worry about me. God has a plan for me. And if I have to fall down once in a while, then I'll do that. We all have obstacles we need to overcome. And we all have the opportunity for second chances. Are you going to take advantage of that or are you going to let it slip by? Reagan County High School baseball team won one game each year for the three years before I got there. We had eight kids show up for baseball season that first year. Now, I don't know how much you all know about baseball. <laughs> Eight is not enough. <laughs> I finally talked two more kids into coming out. That gave us 10 kids. The last two kids couldn't play. We learned a whole lot that first season at Reagan County, and not much of it had to do with baseball. These kids have been pushed down, put down, kicked down, and hit down their whole lives. Like I said, God has a plan. I was the person to be in that job at that time. You see, at 19, when the Brewers drafted me, they gave me $35,000 to chase my dream. And I thought, I am rich. For nine months, I was. <laughs> now, the last time I left my father's house, he could have said a multitude of things. Be careful, good luck, I hope you make it, I wish you the best, I love you. All he could muster after 19 years is do not take that money and go buy a little red sports car. So after I bought it, <laughs> I drove from Brownwood to Phoenix, Arizona, where we had spring training. Ironically, along the way, I drove through Big Lake, Texas, which, by the way, has no lake. <laughs> and as I did, I realized God has a serious sense of humor. Because at 19, in my little red sports car, I thought, who would live here? And he remembered that. Because 15 years later, I did. <laughs> Those 10 kids that first season not learning much about baseball, we learned about respect. These kids, my grandfather always taught me, if you can't respect yourself, you cannot respect other people. We learned to pull our pants up where we go, where they go. We learned to take our jewelry off. We learned to turn our hats around. I told my kids, if you make 9 or $10 million a year, you wear your hat any way you want to. On my baseball field, you're going to wear it the right way. We learned to respect each other. We learned to respect the other team. We learned to respect umpires, the parents who came out not only to help us with the field, but to help cheer for us, scorekeepers. We rebuilt the fences, the batting cages, planted trees, made parking lots. We were the Reagan County Owls. We painted a big, mean-looking owl on a center field fence. Do you know how hard it is to make a mean-looking owl? But these kids respected it because they had done the work themselves. We learned how to do our homework, open doors for teachers, say yes ma'am and no ma'am, and otherwise close our mouths because we're there to learn. And if we're not learning, we can't dream as big as we can possibly dream. These kids bought into it. 
That first season at Reagan County, the kids would won one game each year for the three years before I got there, won 10 games. We were 10 and 0 at home. They did not want anybody coming on their field and beating them on what they had built. When you earn something, you respect it a whole lot more than if somebody just hands it to you. Second season at Reagan County, a small 2A school, I have 63 kids come out from my team. I had more than a football coach had. 